Welcome, Carrie Kasem, to the program. We have a lot to unpack here. And as I mentioned in the introduction, I think just about everybody who is watching this is familiar with your father's work. He was the host of the world famous American Top 40 throughout the 70s and 80s. And the show still runs in syndication. I know it's on Sirius XM. Is it syndicated on terrestrial radio also? It is. It is. They do the oldies and it's on tons of AM stations. It's doing very, very well. So I, I'm, I'm really glad they're keeping my father's memory alive and that people still love the show. I get it on my, my Facebook uh, and Instagram. I'm listening to your dad's show with my kid. And I love that this whole new generation is, is, is listening to my dad. OK, let's come back to that a little later. Here is why we are really talking years ago when your father passed away in that section of his life before he passed away, there was a lot of heartache because his wife would not allow you, your family or his friends see him. And that's why you became an activist to make sure that doesn't happen in other cases because you went through hell in your experience with that. Let's start with he was ill for how long before he passed away? Well, my father was diagnosed uh, with Parkinson's in 2007, uh, and then later diagnosed with Lewy body dementia, which is the worst kind of dementia that you can get. And so it, it, it was just progressive. It got worse and worse and worse. In 2009, he quit American Top 40, and it just progressed from there. But it got worse uh, quickly, not only because the disease progresses quickly, but because his... Uh, physical therapy was taken from him. His medications were switched around. We have people that were in the house that have come and they've, they've made declarations and uh, they talked to my lawyers during this entire case. And it was, it was horrible. It was a house of horrors there. He was put in a room. Nobody came to visit him. The housekeeper was there. Once in a while, they would hire a true caretaker or a nurse. And his phone was taken away. His computer was taken away. Literally, the gates of the house were shut. And it wasn't just us kids that were taken from him and kept from him. It was all of his family and all of his friends. So that's where it started, the isolation. And I realized quickly that uh, the, the cops can't help you because he's in a residential home. So if there's somebody living there that says they don't want you in there, then that's it. That It doesn't matter if it's the house you grew up in. It doesn't matter that that was my dad. If it's her house uh, and she says, I don't want this person in there, we could get trespassed. Um, we called Adult Protective Services. They could do nothing either. Uh, so when we went to court, eventually after three months of not being able to see my dad, and we saw my dad every week, talked to him every day on the phone. Um, when we went to court, I realized very quickly that there are no laws in the United States of America that allow adult children to see their parents if there's an uncooperative caretaker. None, zero. You have no rights. So as I'm fighting in court, to see my dad, I'm saying, okay, if I don't win this case, which I was told by my first two lawyers, I didn't have a chance in hell because my dad was married for 34 years and the wife will always win. I fired them. I actually told my family to get out of my way because they believed them. I hired a lawyer that believed in this case and that believed in me. And we continued to fight. It took eight months. But as through that eight months, here I am doing my radio show and working in LA and then going up to the state capitol to change the law. Because if I wasn't going to win in court, I was going to change the law. Uh, I did win. I did win the impossible case that my first two lawyers told me I would never win. I won guardianship over my dad and I changed the law. But it was too late. By the time I had won guardianship, uh, my stepmother had taken my dad to four different states hiding him. We found him in Washington state and he was in very, very, very bad shape. When I went to Washington State with my paperwork saying I was the guardian, uh, I realized quickly that you cannot cross state lines with a guardianship. You have to fight all over again. So that's what I did. I got a lawyer up there, started fighting, got my dad five weeks later to a hospital. But it was, it was too late at that point. Let me ask you this. What was your relationship with his wife at the beginning of their relationship? When did it turn sour? I mean, she pretended to like us for the first year till my dad asked her to marry him. And it kind of got worse after that. The first, 
I don't know, maybe year of marriage would, seemed okay. Like there were certain things I remember that were nice. And, and uh, she was the first person to get me in the ocean on a boogie board. She, I remember one time she took us to a toy store and she's like, hey guys, pick out a toy, which I thought was so cool. <laughs> I mean, little things like that. Just, she, she was, she seemed to be friendly in the beginning. And then after that, it, it just, it went downhill. I mean, she, we were not allowed at the wedding. She didn't want us there. She, she made it clear that that was, she would call us the old family. So we weren't part of her family. And that, okay. that was clear. Okay, but what was your father's reaction to that? Because you were close to him. Yeah. What, well, what was, did he say? I was nine years old. My brother was eight. My sister was six, right? So he said, uh, she's very insecure and she's going to, she's going to, it's going to get better and she's going to love us. But um, it was, it was horrible. He kept saying that for years and years and years and years. And I remember, I don't know, I had probably 20 years of dealing with this. Uh, my dad was in the car and, and he had just gotten off the phone with Jean and she had been screaming at him. And we could all hear, we could all hear her screaming at him. And we said, dad, when's enough enough? When is this nonsense going to stop? And he said, we're in this, in his, in his car. I'll never forget this. All three kids, all of us. And he says, it's going to get better. And there's a pause and we all start laughing because it was either that or cry. It wasn't getting better. It was getting worse. And it continued to get worse and worse and worse. And the abuse was horrific. Um, the mental anguish that my voice, my, my dad's voice, when I'd call him, he'd sound terrified on the phone. He didn't want me calling the house because she was listening. I mean, it was, it was, it was horrible. It was horrible. Was your, mother and father's divorce acrimonious no it was horrible oh acrimonious <laughs> yeah yeah it was bad yes, yes it, was, it was bad yes it was horrible um and, but they became friends i'd say 20 years 15 years later they were they they stayed friends my dad would come over to my mom's house we'd have christmas we'd have holidays we'd all go to um we'd all go to uh dinners together or they would they would go to my my sister's you know if she's doing something with her kids and you know that the, the grandchildren my nieces uh we'd all get together um several pictures of that we all were okay and my my dad and my stepdad got along really beautifully as well uh so towards the end it was it was good it was and good. when it started to turn negative what was his wife's reason for that? If you had a reason that she would give you. Right. Um, being in this work in this line of, of work now uh, with my foundation case and cares and dealing with people who isolate and who abuse, it's the same pattern. You vilify the loved ones, you vilify the friends, the children, the family members. And it's, it's, it's like a pattern that these people have. And that's why I can play their game so well. Like when I, I've, I've helped people win cases in court, I've gone to court with people because these people, it's all hearsay. There's no evidence to back up anything that they're saying. And if you have the fortitude and the persistence, you will win because there's nothing but lies that they tell you and it's hearsay. So, and, and a lot of times, unfortunately, in these cases, hearsay is acceptable and I don't understand it. It's like, okay, well, we're bad children, we're stealing money, we're doing, I mean, I'm like, well, here's my bank accounts. Tell me where I, I, I make my own living. My sister makes her own living. My brother makes his own living. We don't take money from my dad. Where, where are we stealing money? We, we've been you know, self-sufficient for most our lives. What are you talking about? Where's the evidence of this? And she could never present any of it. In fact, uh, there was a time my dad was very scared uh, he he thought that he wasn't going to be taken care of very well. And he signed a power of attorney of health, not money, nothing else, just health, over to my sister, myself, my brother. My sister is a physician's assistant. Her husband's a cardiologist at UCLA. So my dad would always run every medication and every doctor by both of them. So he wanted them to make medical decisions on his behalf. So he signed over a power of attorney. We have it on video. And we, he said, when the time comes, if it does, pull this out. So during the, the court case, when I was trying to beat my, my, my stepmother in court to just see my dad, 
we didn't, I didn't even care for guardianship or conservatorship. I just wanted visitation. That's all we wanted. We never once in every single court case, never once asked for money. And in the middle of this case, we decided it's now time to pull out the power of attorney, but we decided to just say we had it and decided to just show the actual paperwork because we knew my stepmother would say it's fraudulent. This is not his signature. They're liars. My, my husband would never do this. She said all of that. And we knew she would. Then we pulled out the videotape. So we just wanted to show her character and what she is and what she does. Because it was a constant lie with no evidence. We would tell the truth and we'd back it up with evidence. She once told the court and the, uh, the, the news that we hadn't seen my dad in years. Well, we had every single picture leading up to the week before she stopped us from seeing our dad. Not only that, pictures of his friends who would come over to my sister's house because my dad would always go every weekend to my sister's house and his friends, our family, we'd meet there. Um, we had all the video. We had all the pictures. We had all his friends' testimony. So we kept impeaching her in court, meaning we kept showing that she's a liar. And I eventually won the case. And as far as a will was there a will in place and who got the estate your father's estate my my uh dad's wife jean thompson case and uh, changed all the wills uh, changed the will the estate plans changed everything put everything in her name so we got nothing uh when when we had the people who witnessed it they said he didn't know what he was signing she was screaming at him to sign it and uh and she couldn't there were certain documents she couldn't produce. So the the judge ruled on the will and estate plans uh, that were made in 2011, not when he was sick and uh, neurologically impaired. So it went back to my father. Um, we, did ha we, we didn't know we were in the will. My dad, we never discussed that, which is unfortunate. I think you should discuss what you want to give your kids, with your kids, who you want to give things to. So everybody knows. When you keep it a secret, it's like, well, we, we didn't think we got anything at this point. We're like, okay, well, dad, we know dad left, left us a trust and that's fine. But he did leave us stuff in the will and she had taken everything from us and she did uh, eventually get, get everything. And at the end of his life, I remember reading this, you, I think, wanted to keep him on or not keep him on some kind of life support or vice versa. But uh, there was a cremation situation and a burial situation that were argued about too. Can you fill me in on that? Sure, sure. Well, that's another myth that was out there that that we unplugged him and that wasn't the case. We The doctors came in and there were three of them. And I was fighting to keep my dad alive. I did everything I could to keep him alive, everything. We did everything for two weeks in that hospital in Washington. And I remember when they came in and they said, You've got two choices. Your father's dying. If you keep him on hydration and nutrition, he's going to drown to death in his own fluids and it's going to be painful. Or you can let the natural dying process take place. Uh, dying bodies are not hungry, nor are they thirsty. When you see a dying animal, and I, this had to be explained to me because I, at this point I was, I couldn't hear this. Like I had done everything to see my dad again and to save him and I couldn't. And this is kind of where my sister stepped in with her medical degree and her understanding of death because she worked at the veterans hospital in palliative care, end of life care. She's like, when a body is dying, they are not hungry, nor are they thirsty. Dad's not going to feel thirsty or hungry. He is dying. And it was like, I remember that it was like a shock to me. It was like I got punched in the stomach. So there was no taking him off. My dad was actively dying. And this is another uh, lie my, my stepmother perpetrated into the media that we took him, we unplugged him. There was no unplugging. My dad was going to die either way. Was it going to die naturally without pain or he was going to drown to death? And there was, what, what do you say to that? You, know, you yeah. don't want your dad to drown in his own fluids. Was there a specification that he wanted to be cremated or buried? How did that get handled? I know he was buried out of the country, right? Yeah, he wanted to be buried in Forest Lawn uh, in Los Angeles, where he lived for 58 years. Uh, Mike Kerb, his dear friend, and uh, he was an ex-lieutenant governor of California, and he, he he's the owner of Kerb Records now in, in, in Nashville, Tennessee, a massive success and an amazing man. And Mike uh, told my dad, look, I want to pay for your funeral. That, that's 
that I want to pay for this. This is what I want to give to you, you know, and they agreed on it. In fact, Mike wrote a letter stating this exact same thing, signed it. Uh, when we, we, I got, I got signatures from about 30 people. I got, um, statements from people when my stepmother tried to bury my father in Jerusalem, she was told no. Then she tried to bury him in France. She was told no. Then she took my father's body to Canada, five miles away from where her boyfriend grew up from his house in Canada. And we stopped that there. We got all over the media. We got to Canada. So then she writes a letter with her daughter stating that they're Norwegian and that my father always wanted to be buried in Norway. My father's never been to Norway. They don't play a show in Norway. I mean, if anything, it's, you know, Lebanon, where his entire family was from. But she's burying a man in Norway, lying about her Norwegian background. So we got her own family to write a letter stating they're not Norwegian. We sent all these letters. We sent all these declarations. And they still allowed her to bury him in Norway. And the reason why? They believed her. There was no evidence uh, at all. And when we got on the phone with them, like, why? Well, we, we believe that she wanted, we, she's going to move here and live here and, and tender your father's grave. Did she move there? No. Has she had a boyfriend for the past seven years? Yes. Are they living in my dad's house? Yes. Was her boyfriend driving my father's car everywhere? Yes. Wow. As there, as, as, are there people now who are coming out saying, yes, they were living together while your dad was in another room? We have all this. We have so it all. You have a law on the books now in California and other states you've been campaigning in to get this taken care of so it doesn't happen to other people? That's right. So we have, um, it's called the Case and Care Visitation Bill, and my team is amazing. Uh, you know, there's no way I could have done this by myself. My stepdad, uh, my lawyer at the time, and uh, Mike Gatta, who was a representative there, took on the bill and we created it and we got it passed. It took two years to get it passed in California. We now have uh, 12 states with 13 bills and nine other states that have adopted a version of the Case and Care Visitation Bill. We have 21 states with 22 bills. And I want it to go federally and we're going to get all 50 states. So it allows, thank you, thank you. Um, it allows a judge to just rule on visitation. So you don't have to go through an entire trial fight over a power of attorney, guardianship, conservatorship. Uh, and, and there's no forced visitation. If mom or dad doesn't want to see you uh, and, and they're, they're cognizant about it, then it's no, no forced visitation. If mom or dad are not able to, to express themselves or talk, then you look at the history of visitation and the judge can make a ruling there. It's that simple. Who owns the rights to American Top 40 now? I'm pretty sure iHeartRadio. I'm like Clear Channel. So um, she doesn't have possession of that. I think he sold everything. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not quite sure on everything, but I know that he uh, he got he extended his contract. I think it was eight years when he when Ryan Seacrest took over, and he Ryan Seacrest took American Top Forty. My dad had uh, American Top Twenty, and they extended his his contract, and I, he was pretty happy with it. And I'm pretty sure they own it. If if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure they own all of it. Well, during a year like we've had with this pandemic, you look for this kind of comfort and American Top 40 provides that whenever I'm in the car, I put it on on Sirius XM uh -huh. and just reminisce about the good old days when they were just counting down the hits. Can we end on a lighter note? I hope this is a lighter note and I'm fairly sure, I don't know for a fact, I'm just gonna throw this at you. If you're aware of that outtake that your father has that circulated all over the place about yeah. the dog dying, is, is, was he amused by that when it got out or was he upset? You know, he didn't care. He's like, whatever, you know, he, yeah. but he's such, everybody who knows him knows that he's a, he's a good guy. And the guy who did that, you know, shame on him, I think, because when you're having a bad day, you're going through a divorce, you're not, you're, mm. you know, any, everybody has their bad moments. But my dad, I always say he's like Gandhi. I literally, and then there are other people who said that your dad reminds me of Gandhi. He was so loving and caring and he always had these wonderful anecdotes about life and he always said you know when we'd ask him to buy us things like have you have you heard the can i tell a quick story do we have sure. time or no yeah go um, ahead. when i was 16 my i thought for sure i'd get a car right all i'm growing up in beverly hills i could <laughs> i could help 
you know, take my brother and sister to school. Uh, my friends had cars. Of course, I'm going to get a car, right? So I, I keep hinting at my father about a car. And he, he tells me, he gives me, leading up to the weeks of my birthday, he tells me, um, okay, it's, it's silver. And I'm like, okay, silver's okay. It's a, it's, it's, it's a good, it's a good color for a car. Uh, he tells me it's uh, metal and it has keys. So on my 16th birthday, my brother and sister are excited. My friends are excited. Even my mom was excited. And we go to my dad's house and there's a big box sitting in the living room. And I'm thinking, what is this? Maybe my keys are in it. Go to open the box, very heavy. There's styrofoam around it. And my brother and sister come over and help pick this thing up out of the box. And we pull away the styrofoam and there it is. It's silver, it's metal, it's got keys. It was my brand new typewriter. <laughs> That's my dad. Uh, and, and it's like a car? Well, you're not getting good enough grades. How are you going to pay for the gas? And he would always say, if I buy it for you, you won't take care of it. It won't mean anything to you. But if you buy it and you work for it, you know, it, it will mean something to you. You'll take care of it. You'll have self-esteem. You'll have work ethic. That was my dad. Um, so he was not a big, huge gift giver. But what he gave me was really priceless you know, these, these amazing anecdotes in life that we grew up with. And, and he was right about all of them. And when he made a statement like that, Carrie, did he end it with, and now on with the countdown. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I wanted to kill him. <laughs> I'm like my typewriter. What is hey, it? you were 60. That's too young for a car. Hey, Carrie, uh, continued success on all Thank these you. issues that you're working on and, and trying to change things in, in that direction with what happened with your father and with your career. I know you're in the broadcasting industry too, so good luck with that. Thank you. And if anybody's going through this or needs help, they're being kept from a loved one, they can always go to caseomcares.org and uh, and we can help you out there. We have a we have a hotline and we have we have bills in place and, and help for you. All right, that's K A S E M. Mm-hmm. Care. Caseomcares.org, yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. Thank you it. so much, Gary. All right. Bye. So uh, life ain't what you think it is with some of these celebrities, huh? Wow. I wonder if his wife, when Casey said, hey, my daughter wants a car, and his wife went, give her a typewriter. I wonder if that was from her, too. <laughs>